What is good, email geeks? This is the Email Design Podcast, your home for all things email. We're talking design, development, marketing, and we are your hosts. I am Kevin Mandeville. And I'm Jason Rodriguez. And coming up on today, we got so many good things to talk about. We're going to talk about some 2017 email stats, type kit fonts and emails, maybe a little rumor mill over uh, ESP acquisition. Uh, but I want to kick things off. I mean, we're fresh off of Litmus Live in London, Jason, yeah. which was a fantastic event. Yeah, it was and awesome. I want to, I want to kick things off talking about a couple of the hacks from the email hack session, was a de- which was a debut and I think is really perfect for our podcast audience. Want to talk about it here. The videos are going to come out, which you should definitely watch because it goes probably into a little bit more detail than we will, but thought it was worth to cover on the podcast. And the first one I want to go over is Mark Robbins with his get off the table uh, sort of hack. So Mark is actually working on trying to come up with a truly tableless layout for email, uh, not even conditional yep. uh, tables for Outlook, like not even those, just pure divs, even for the word rendering engine. And he has made some significant progress, which is really, really exciting. Uh, and, and the key to all of this is to be able to use the MSO specific properties, these CSS properties, which are only specific to the word Outlook rendering engine uh, or the word rendering engine, I should say that Outlook uses. Uh, and so he's able to get a one column layout to work. And the magic that really happens is on a div, if you use the MSO dash element dash frame dash width, so MSO element frame width, and then you have a fixed pixel value with it, that's actually going to convert the table from a, or convert the div to a table uh, and respect that width. Uh, he uses the property MSO element with the value of para border div to basically allow nesting of tables inside. Uh, and one of the frustrating things so far, one of the limitations is that there isn't a way to currently have nested multiple columns. And that's sort of one of the key call to actions for the community to help to research. Uh, but he also uses MSO element left uh, property with value of center to basically center align the container, which is a little weird, but you know, it's, it's word. So what, what else do you expect? And then MSO element wrap property with the value of no wrap beside to stop any additional content floating alongside it. So if you put all of those on what would be your typical wrapper container, you're actually going to create a solid one column layout. In this instance, it'd be something like, you know, 600 pixels, and then you could have your images, your texts or whatever. Uh, and so he outlines the key challenges so far is getting backgrounds to work, multiple columns inside the container, things like that. But I really view the multi-column layout as sort of the key issue because that really affects then our ability to do layouts for all the other clients. So we want to be able to figure out a way to get that working. But I thought it was a fascinating development here and really, really groundbreaking. Yeah, I really like this. This has long been the holy grail for email designers, get rid of tables, um, which in like my own emails, I've gotten it to the point where I'm table free except for that MSO conditional table. Um, so I feel like happy with that. But yeah, again, I'm not doing any multi-column stuff or anything like that. But I love this detective kind of work and going through all these MSO elements and properties and find the one that's actually going to work for this. Um, so yeah, really cool to see. Again, like you mentioned, there's a couple of layouts issues too contend with there's like a really small blue outline around that content um you know background images aren't going to work uh and the key one like you said is that multi-column layout but hopefully we can all kind of throw our heads together and figure out some solutions to some of these fairly major problems um and if we can then who knows maybe one day we'll be building table for emails which would be absolutely amazing and the conversation is happening over on, so Mark created a GitHub for this. And so there's a whole lot of good stuff happening on the issues. So be definitely subscribe to this thread, follow along with it uh, to, to, you know, just stay tuned. Yeah. And you can also use Stig. Stig has a great resource of all the MSO specific properties or basically CSS that works in the word rendering engine. And it's completely searchable. So definitely use this 
resource. We'll link to it in the show notes to help you investigate the potential possibilities of what we can do. Uh, and it definitely is a bit of troubleshooting because even though this is documentation, it isn't necessarily the best. It doesn't clearly outline what all the possible values are for yeah, certain yeah. properties. So that's, it's definitely... That's the trouble. There's there's so many of these properties to dig through. and It's over 200. Yeah, so I'm sure Mark's just kind of kicked off the start of it and there's a lot more investigation to do um like you said yeah the documentation just absolutely sucks uh <laughs> so if, what, what, if you're go ahead one of the things i would love people to try to figure out i think the key to this is if we can if if we can figure out a way to get divs to convert to tape tables and consistently be able to figure out a method that's sort of bulletproof yeah. i think we're golden because yeah. so many of those mso properties allow you to target tables or table cell elements but not necessarily just like divs or whatnot so but the issue is is that again it, it converts it for sort of the parent div but it doesn't convert it to tables for the sub divs yep. so if anybody can figure out a way to convert divs to tables regardless of whether they're nested or whatnot i think we may be on to something yeah absolutely uh, so yeah, hopefully the community will come up with something. There's there's a good community discussion too. Mark posted, uh, kind of talking about the article and some of his ideas in the Litmus community. Um, so maybe we'll put that in the show notes too because there's been a lot of discussion on that thread as well. Uh, but moving on, another great email hack from London was this one from Remy. Uh, he essentially got a camera working in an email. Um, so his inspiration for this was the classic Game Boy and the Game Boy camera that I'm sure everybody remembers and has very fond memories of. I know I do. Um, but he wanted to see if he could take that Game Boy camera concept and build it into an email. Um, so the way he kind of got clued into the ability to actually do something like this was he was playing around in CodePen um, and had this dynamic image colorizing uh, pen that he had built out um, or a CodePen member built out Noah Blonde. And uh, he noticed that there's an input type of color um, that allows you to, it'll pop open a color palette and like color selector um, in certain OSs. So using the input tag with a type of color pops that open. So he was kind of curious, did a little research and found out there's actually an input uh, type of file that you could add into an email. And on iOS, when you add that, then it'll actually open up Apple's iOS share sheet that allow you to do certain things, pick a photo from a library, pick something from iCloud, Dropbox. Uh, but most importantly here, it allows you to access the camera on the device and take a photo. So when that happens, uh, iOS will take that picture and it'll dump the thumbnail onto that page next to that choose file button. Uh, so you get the input, you get the thumbnail, and you get a little bit of text saying, you know, one photo has been uploaded, whatever. Um, so he actually found out there's some WebKit specific uh, CSS and selectors that he could use to hide the input, hide that text next to it, and then grab that image and resize it to fill the viewport. Um, so doing this, you know, combining all this stuff allowed him to build out an actual camera inside of an email campaign he showed it off working uh it, it was pretty awesome so i think this has you know this has some legs i think we could see some really cool implementations of this um for some really interesting effects you know we were talking about uh, i think chad white and remy and i were talking about you know this would be great for somebody like jib jab um to build something like this into their email campaign and take advantage of the camera in an email so there's a whole code pen up on it um you know we'll link this medium article that remy put together walking you through all the concepts and how he implemented it uh but a great technique i was really excited to see this one in in uh the email hack session and i feel like this one definitely blew some minds out there yeah this was just wild right this yeah. is one of those things it's just like what uh so so cool and yeah like you said this actually has a lot of cool applications to it uh, so I'm interested to see what people do with it. Jibjab would be perfect for something like this. Uh, you could definitely see something like maybe doing a green screen type of yeah. effect for yeah. users to somehow incorporate that into a campaign. Or obviously, you know, the obvious one that always jumps out is doing Instagram type filters yep. or Snapchat filters. Not that you could mimic exactly the facial recognition stuff, but you could say to people, okay, like, you know, uh, put line your up head your head, here. yeah, exactly. Right, right. And then it just overlays so, the image. 
Um, I'm interested to see if anybody can actually really do that into an actual campaign because I definitely think there's a use case uh, and it's really, really cool. I think one of the only downsides to this is that because on iOS, you can't exactly post with these forms yep. that you can't submit it somewhere, which is disappointing. Uh, I wonder if there's somehow a workaround with that. Um, I think you could get something going where uh, another great talk at the conference was Seal Gross's talk on um, interactive forms and email. And I think he addressed that a little bit. You can't post, um, but you can do some sort of hack with the Git method and actually use that as a workaround to post information from a form. Um, so maybe when we start releasing these videos and stuff, you know, somebody can take some of those concepts, mash them together and figure out a way to do that. Or, you know, he was talking about taking that uh, when you, instead of doing the post, it just dumps you over to a landing page that allows you to take that functionality in account. Um, but yeah, this would be awesome to see something like that in an email. Yeah. So I absolutely love this session. Obviously I'm biased cause I was a part of it, but, uh, you know, definitely encourage everybody to check out the videos after the fact because yeah. uh, these were pretty, pretty brilliant. All right, so we also have some really exciting news at Litmus. Uh, we came out with sort of a brand new product. Uh, we launched a brand new Chrome extension. So we've basically taken the power of Litmus and everything you love about it, and we put it into a Chrome extension, which really has two core use cases. You can test local HTML files on your desktop, so on your local machine, alongside your favorite code editor, whichever one you prefer, or you can test campaigns inside of your ESP. Uh, and so it's really those two key use cases. Uh, and I sort of just want to walk through each individual one. So the first one, when you're testing local HTML files, all you have to do is open up uh, that local file, which it can be an actual literally like, you know, the, the file path. Or if you're using a build system and it's on a local host of some kind, there's support for that too. And when it's in the browser and you have the extension installed, you just click on the Litmus icon in the top right once you have it installed. And it's going to run and generate all the previews for you. Uh, and this really mirrors the builder experience. If you've ever used builder, you can click in and view individual previews of the individual email clients. You can make them full screen. You can toggle images on or off if there's a client that supports that view. And then you can also keyboard toggle through all of the uh, different clients. Uh, and you can click on the arrows or just do left or right. So it's super fast. So when you're in this local development use case. It's super iterative and it's super fast for you. And the great thing about it is that you then all you have to do is go into your sort of editor, just make a, a quick change, hit save, and we have live reload built right in. So it's going to reload and refresh the browser for you. And it's going to refresh the previews as well. Uh, so it really gets that iterative process in place. So you don't even have to use Builder anymore if you don't want. If you want to use your editor, whether it's Dreamweaver, Brackets, Sublime Text, Coda, Atom, uh, I mean, heck, Notepad, if you want to use Notepad, it doesn't really matter because it's using it in the browser. You can use whatever editor you want alongside it, and it's going to bring that iterative workflow right to you, which is really exciting, Jason. I mean, so many people yeah. want to stick to their editor and we, we're we trying to get to that local workflow and this, this really enables it for them. Yeah, I feel like this is one of the most long-awaited features for Litmus and Builder and now it's here, <laughs> which I think is going to make a lot of people happy. Um, so we're just trying to get the word out there and have you guys start using it and improve your workflows. Yeah, and so yeah, any editor, any task runners, you know, grunt, gulp, whatever, build a uh, you know, build systems or frameworks, if you're using Zurb, MJML, it'll work with all of this because it works in the browser and it grabs a compiled view. Uh, and then just sort of the second key use case is once you're in your ESP, and again, it it does have to be a supported ESP. Right now we currently support MailChimp, Campaign Monitor, Salesforce Marketing Cloud, formerly known as Exact Target, IBM, Watson, Campaign Automation, formerly known as SilverPop, and then uh, Eloqua. Uh, but once you're in a campaign, anytime you're editing a draft, you can just click on the litmus icon and it's not just going to generate previews, but it's going to generate a full litmus checklist for you. So it's going to give you previews, but it's also going to check your links, your images, your tracking. Just make sure that there's no errors. It'll alert you if there are. You can take a look at it 
And so it's a full checklist and you can always just click to view and open the checklist right inside the litmus app. So you can share with your teammates as well and, and sort of go from there. So uh, we're just really excited about this. You can go to litmus.com slash extension to check it out. Uh, and if you weren't listening, I kind of did a demo guide walkthrough of everything. Um, you know, so definitely download, check it out. Uh, we're really excited about it. We think it's going to be a, a massive improvement to your workflow. You don't have to constantly be switching between your editor and Litmus and your ESP. Or there's none of that copying and pasting. It sort of works locally with your file, or you don't have to send tests constantly from your ESP to to Litmus. It's just you click the icon on the extension, and you're off and testing right there. Uh, and any any changes you make in your ESP as well, you can just easily refresh. Uh, so everything's super iterative. Uh, and if you want that, again, special podcast offer, just go to Litmus.com slash gift card and input the coupon code podcast for a free 14-day trial of Litmus to test this stuff out. Uh, so definitely check that out. Uh, and don't forget, free for, uh, don't forget we have our podcast at emaildesignpodcast.com. All of our show notes links are right there. You can uh, tweet along with the hashtag email design podcast and please subscribe. Subscribe on SoundCloud, YouTube, or iTunes, whichever one you prefer. Uh, definitely get the podcast as soon as it drops. Again, nice notification uh, and it's you know a nice easy way to share it as well. All right, moving on to some stats, which I think everybody loves and hates, uh, but Adobe released uh, recently their third annual consumer email report. Uh, which is a fairly dense 46 slides, a uh, lot to pick through there. Um, not the greatest slide design in the world, just lots of information. But our friends over at Really Good Emails, uh, you know, took the initiative and uh, weeded through all of that information and picked out some key findings here. So they had this great post over on their Medium account, their Medium publication, that just goes through all the latest stats from Adobe. Um some good ones, you know, I it, it seems like email use outside of work is down a little bit. People aren't as keen to check their email at all hours of the day, um, but they are still checking email. And email is still the preferred method of contact by brands. So that's actually up 24% uh, from last year. So 61% of respondents uh, said that they would prefer email, uh, brands contacting them via email as opposed to anything else like direct mail, mobile apps, social media, all that good stuff. Um, so that's huge. The next one was direct mail, which was down to 18%. Uh, so when people start talking about, you know, the death of email, I feel like that's one of those key stats that you could kind of throw back in their face and say, you know, email's not going anywhere, um, especially for younger people. Uh, usage was actually up, so ages 25 to 34, uh, it, it was up to 75% of respondents would check email while watching TV movie, 76% uh, would check while they're in bed, 48% while on vacation. Um, so all those numbers looking good, you know, people uh, that dreaded kind of millennial uh, age bracket, they're still using email, they still love email. Uh, so this is this is great to see, you know, we're all working in the industry, we love seeing stats like this and validating a lot of the work we do. Um, some design things to keep in mind, and just kind of marketing strategy things to keep in mind. Um, one of the questions was, if you could change one thing about the emails you get from brands, what would it be? Uh, the top choice was make them less about promotion and more about providing me information. So I think this is absolutely key, you know, far too often people just throw some deals or coupons in an email, uh, talk about their latest sale or the newest product, but they don't provide a lot of value and information to subscribers. So that's something we definitely want to keep in mind. Um, another great one is that people, uh, you need to focus on the design of your email uh, because poor design was one of the things as one of the most annoying things receiving an email offer from a marketer uh, was poor design, things that don't work well on mobile. So it's definitely some key takeaways here. You know, we want to make things personal. Uh, we want to make things very informative, provide like really good value in our email content, um, and then make sure that it works well on mobile devices because 20% of consumers are checking those on mobile devices and they get annoyed when things aren't optimized for mobile. So uh, some good stuff there. Uh, definitely read through this Medium article if you're that into it. Then they do link out to that Adobe slide deck, which is, again, 46 pretty dense slides. Um, but if you do want to take some key stats away from there, you can check that out as well. They tried to kill email, but we brought it back. I mean, yep, email is going nowhere. Nope. It's going nowhere. 
A uh, couple things I thought were interesting. Just I think the checking email less is an interesting trend, and I think it's important to note that I don't. I wouldn't say that that's necessarily a bad thing, right? Yeah. Um, or or it doesn't mean that people are any less engaged with email per se. I mean that could be a variety of factors, but I think that's something interesting to you know, look out for over the next few years. It could be that people are getting more efficient with their email in terms of like triaging it, managing it with, you know, all these tools that are out there for email now. Um, I just thought, I I thought it was interesting and I didn't necessarily took that to be a bad thing. And then obviously I thought the, the other key trend was just how much people cared about personalization. Yeah. Um, you know, and, and they said uh, they don't like it when they get emails that aren't personalized, but then it's also kind of creepy if there's too much personalization, too. So uh, interesting, interesting trend there that that was that seemed to be pretty top of mind for a lot of people. Uh, and that's obviously we got to hit that sweet spot as email marketers. That's a tough thing for us to do, right? Yeah, absolutely. So, yeah, always work to do, always things to improve. But hopefully this let you kind of focus in on what you do need, do need to focus on and improve those campaigns. Um, so some great news from Typekit, Adobe Typekit, uh, which is, you know, one of the best providers for web fonts on the web. Uh, but they recently announced that they're improving their service to use CSS only font importing. Uh, so this opens up the way to use Typekit fonts in HTML email, which is awesome. Um, so before they only allowed essentially a JavaScript uh, import to happen when you were using Typekit fonts, but now they're doing both the HTML link uh, method of importing fonts and then the actual CSS at import method for using web fonts, which allows us as email developers to bring those fonts in our emails, which is absolutely huge uh, because Typekit has one of the best collections of web fonts out there in existence. They have amazing type foundries, amazing fonts, some of the most popular and beautiful type typefaces you'll ever see you know uh so now we can bring that into our email designs which is absolutely huge um so no longer you're not you're not beholden to using google fonts even though there's some great options out there uh you can start using something like typekit to improve your email designs which is absolutely huge yeah this is great this is something i definitely need we use typekit so it's always been a pain to have to if we use something in email you know you're trying to go and download the fonts to then self-host them Oh, it's such a pain. So this is amazing. And the fact that they give you the option for both link or the import, whichever one you want is fantastic. I don't really think there's going to be a major performance difference between either of those Mm -hmm. uh, because it is email. Again, a lot of the performance slowdowns happen because of JavaScript uh, or large images or just too many assets. Um, I would say, I think we should watch out because this is sort of a, it's a very popular service and Typekit has been known to slow down with their JavaScript. Uh, Just watch out the load times for these resources. If you're using maybe especially a popular type of font, uh, you know, I would just say, just keep an eye out on the load time and your performance of the, these particular assets for your campaigns. I would say that this is great as long as Adobe Typekit is being able to handle the scale and there isn't any, negative impact on performance. Otherwise, you know, you might want to stick to sort of self hosting and managing that yourself. Uh, I do have confidence in them, but just a little caveat. I thought it's important to just take a look at as we're moving forward. All right. Rumor mill right. time, Kevin late on rumor mill, Jason rumor, rumor, rumor mill is Google getting ready to buy Marketo headline from an article over on Martech today. And so Marketo announced a multi-year alliance, which I think is really interesting, uh, yeah. the, the term alliance instead of partnership, <laughs> uh, but a multi-year alliance with Google Cloud. Uh, so beginning next year, Marketo is going to move its products from its independent data centers to the Google Cloud platform. Uh, and it also involves joint investments in areas such as artificial intelligence, And the integration of Marketo's platform with Google Analytics and uh, the G Suite apps as well. Uh, So an interesting move here uh, in the fact that they're kind of doing some PR around it. And really, it just leads to the question of if these two services, well, you know, really Google and all of their entire umbrella of everything that they do between and they especially harped on the AI component here, but you know, you think about AI, you think about them with Gmail, 
Uh, is Marketo going to be an acquisition target for, for Google? What do you think, Jason? I uh, I mean, it definitely seems like it uh, based on the information that they've been releasing. You know, if you go to Marketo's website, that's the first thing you see is information about their that press release and they're partnering up with Google. Um, so it seems like, you know, as Marketo, yeah, they're migrating all of their data over to Google's cloud service. Um, it seems like they're setting up for it, which will be interesting to see. You know, these are both really big contenders in you know, the marketing technology space and then the ad tech space for Google. Uh, so I think they're really looking to build that integration between marketing and ad and, you know, all of that Google offers as far as like AdWords and analytics goes. Um, so it'll be interesting. I, I think it'll be good for Marketo users. Uh, they'll rumor to be getting some new, better, you know, better speeds for their platform, um, better analytics, better access to Google suite offerings, things like that, which will be awesome. Um, but it'll be interesting to watch and see what happens over the next couple of years. Do you think Google should get into the ESP business at all? Like forget individually Marketo. Do you think they should just get into that business? Um, I think it would be strange for them to do that. I think it's more that they want the integration between marketing and advertising and analytics. Um, so it makes sense there. But I don't see them doing a lot on the actual like ESP sending side if they do acquire Marketo or anybody else for that matter. Um It'll be interesting to see. I, I don't think they have any like strong plans to take on, you know, like Salesforce as a competitor or something like that. You know, it's it's more for that integration between marketing and advertising. Yeah, no, I, I agree. I think I think it comes down to, well, if they are going to get into, you know, again, that marketing advertising area, which they obviously have a lot of products in, yep. then it would make sense to do this uh, to, to get into the business. It's just it's. It's not going to be a major money maker for you know yeah, something yeah. the size of Google, right? Obviously, a, Marketo is a fantastic business, doing you know well. ESP business we know is incredibly fruitful, but you know when you're looking at this the scale of of Google, it's yeah, like well, uh, an ESP sure maybe something like Salesforce can get you there to like billions, but it's like you know Google this is a, a small small little fish for yeah, them. It's, to really it's a be drop in the bucket about. for them. Yeah. Yeah, it's a drop in the bucket, but I, I and I think for I, I think I think with Google it actually would probably be more interesting to target something like Mailchimp or something that's yeah. more broad based, you know, broadly consumer based. Um but I think it's interesting. I can definitely see an ESP fitting into all of their other services that they have. Mm -hmm. Uh, and it could be a good move for them to potentially do that. It's probably, it's probably inevitable if they're if if these other services stay open and whatnot. It's probably inevitable that they'll do something. Yeah. So we'll we'll have to wait and see. That'll be interesting to see what happens. Hopefully they're not listening to the podcast and go and acquire Mailchimp because uh, I don't know if I want that to happen or not. But but we'll see. All right, let's get on to our email of the week. Uh, this week it's an awesome campaign from Uber. Uh, that's all about connecting your calendar and streamlining your schedule. So the key here, you know, it's it's a beautiful, like, well-designed, clean layout. It works well on mobile. Uh, but the key here is that they do this trick with their copy where they blur out some words and force your eyes to scan the copy. And it, it spells out this great message. So the full copy goes, we know life can be busy. That's why you're always skimming and scanning everything that you read, even this email, along with briefs, documents, text messages, all to save time. A quick sync is something you dread. And could your calendar be any more full? Time is precious, but with Uber, it's easy to save more. You probably won't read any further, so just tap to get started uh, with a CTA blow to sync now. But the trick here is that they use CSS to blur out specific portions of that copy so that all you're left with is this bit of copy that your eyes are immediately drawn to when you're scanning. It says, we know that you're scanning this email to save time. Sync your calendar with Uber to save more, which I think is absolutely brilliant. This is this is one of the cooler campaigns I've seen recently. Um, you know, this is all still live HTML text. They're just using, adjusting the color of these little spans, uh, and then they're using text shadow to make this blurred effect, which is absolutely fantastic. And it just makes that message that much more succinct. Uh, and it's it's just a really cool, clever trick to see in an email. Um, so I absolutely love this. It's awesome. Yeah. And great art up at the top, you know, yeah. for the header area. It's really like a calendar, but it looks like buildings and they have a car driving around. I thought that was brilliant. Uh, and what I love about 
this effect here is that this really falls back gracefully, mm -hmm. you know? Uh, and if I actually just use the extension here to run a test on the web page, you can also see we go into something like Outlook 2007. It doesn't have the blur effect, yep. but it still has the different colors. Yep. So the text still stands out. Um, and so that's what's great. They're able to enhance that sort of blur text shadow effect for clients that support it. But for those that don't, the, the text still stands out because they use spans to individually make the text colors different. So it still falls back gracefully, which is uh, really, really cool in my opinion. And, and, you know, really, really well done. Um, I mean, yeah. Th and this is just one of those things where it's just like, it's just so clever, right? It's, yeah. it's just a nice little graphic and just pure copy. And it's, you know, it's just using pure text. It's, it's not the most intricate thing in the world. It's just smart. Right. Yep. And it's, it's one of those things that seems so simple that why didn't anybody else think of it before? You know, maybe somebody has used a technique technique like this, uh, but I haven't seen it yet. So this is, I feel like that's one of those things <laughs> that somebody's likely to steal and use all over the place. Um, but hopefully they credit Uber for the initial inspiration. Yeah. Uber's been coming out with some really cool emails this year. They do so. really good emails. Yeah. Shout out to Uber. All right, folks, that's going to do it. This edition of the podcast. Reminder, emaildesignpodcast.com, full show notes, links. It's all going to be right there. Past episodes, too. Check it out. Tweet along with the hashtag, emaildesignpodcast. Subscribe on SoundCloud, YouTube, or iTunes. Get the podcast as soon as it drops. And don't forget, limits.com slash gift card and put the coupon code podcast for a free 14-day trial. Check out the Limits extension, limits.com slash extension. We think you're really going to like it. It's going to be a big impact for your workflow. See ya. Thank you.